Well, welcome everyone. I'm Kirk Allen. Um, if you have questions about VMDP, that's me. I'm Mr. VMDP. Um, so today I just wanted to have a presentation to kind of describe what that is, because many of you may not know. Um, and then also, with in conjunction with the VMDP, then I also handle all the Microsoft certifications that, that are involved therein. Um, the WICL certifications of the drivers, and then separate from that we have the, the SVVP, which is the Server Virtualization Validation Program. And so we'll talk about those few things. Um, so I'm based in, in Provo, I'm on the virtualization team, and so here we go. So the VMDP components, well, they're all Windows drivers. It's all Windows stuff. Um, first of all, we have the kernel drivers. Um, those consist of your sys file, your INF file, and your cat file. So those are kind of a bundle that you have to keep together if you want to install them. Um, we also have services, which are EXEs. And we also have all of our little utilities that I use. A lot of them have grown out of debugging reasons that I've just kind of thrown in that make it easy for me to debug VMDP and I just included them in the, in the little utilities packages for, for additional help for in case anybody needed them. So what, what kernel drivers do we have? We have those that are common between Zen and KVM. Um, and so I came up with this name, um, PVVX is my para virtual vertio Zen drivers. Um, and so, since the majority of the drivers, the top end, talking to Microsoft, you know, Windows, is the same. The bottom end, how it talks to the virtualization platform, that's what's different. And so I thought, well, rather than maintain two separate drivers, let me combine them together. That way I only have to submit one WICL package and makes things a little bit easier. You only have to install once, then if you boot Zen one time or KVM the next time, the driver's already installed. Um, so we have our PVVX BN, which on KVM handles the, the balloon, the ballooning, and also it facilitates some memory st statistics flowing back and forth between the guest and the, and the back end, and we use the, the service to help facilitate that as well. On the Zen side, it handles ballooning as well, and it also handles all the Zen bus functionality. Then we have our PVVX block driver, which is your Zen or VertIO block driver. Um, also the, the SCSI driver, which you know, basically is the same as the block driver, other than the, the SCSI driver more or less just takes the whole request, tosses it over the fence, retrieves it back. And so in that case, it's a little bit easier, but it's, it's a little bit more difficult to set up, at least in the Zen side. Um, but that's the SCSI driver, Zen or VertIO SCSI driver combined. Then the other combined driver we have is our, our net driver, our, our Zen net or VertIO net driver. And that handles all the LAN stuff. Now in KVM, we have additional drivers that Zen doesn't have. We have the VertIO serial driver, you know, that handles the serial stuff. It's mostly used in conjunction with the with the two services, the, the, the QMU guest agent and the VD agent. We also have the VertIO RNG or the random number generator driver. That's based on the, the RNG device on, that, that gets populated into the guest. There's the crash notify driver. Basically that's the, the PV panic device. And we have the, the firmware configuration device. So those are the ones that are specific to KVM. <clears throat> now we have our services that we have. We have our PVVX service. Um, in VertIO, that's used a lot with the Vert V to V. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, it handles some of the ha handing off of memory st statistics between the front end and the back end. On the Zen side, this is where the service originated originally, was that if you did uh, uh, an XM or an XL destroy or shutdown, well, a shutdown, if you did an XL shutdown, basically just pulled the power on the VM because there was no way that you know, it didn't have ACPI and so it didn't know that it was supposed to shut down. So the service catches that and then does a Windows shutdown so it can gracefully shut down the VM. Then 
on KVM specifics, we have our QMU guest agent. Um, you know, that, that communicates a lot of the VM information from the, from the VM to the, to, the, to the host side. Um, and again, it uses the Virtio serial driver to communicate that information back and forth. Um, you have to have the guest agent channel in your VM to take advantage of that. Um, and then we have the, the VD agent. That's useful because that allows you to do um, cut, copy, and paste between the VM and the host. Um, and that requires you to use the, the SPICE driver for that functionality to work. <coughs> then we have our utilities. The, part of the VMDP package, we have the top level setup. That basically is just a little, uh, just a little thing that when you run setup, it determines if you're on a 32-bit or 60-bit, 64-bit host, and then spawns off the the appropriate may, uh, setup that that does all the work. Um, the reason we do that is because if you run a 32-bit setup application, it will work and it will install but it puts everything in program files x86. And since we have 64-bit drivers, we didn't think that was a good idea, so you need to run a 64-bit setup, and then it puts it in just regular program files. Um, so yeah, the main, the, that's the top-level setup. Then we have the regular setup that does all the install, all the upgrades of all the different files that compose of the package. Um, conversely, we have our uninstall. That takes everything out of the VM deletes all the files, cleans up all the registry information, just as if you'd never installed it in the first place. Uh, then we have the PV control utility. That's a command line utility that does a lot of nifty little things to help configure drivers, all kinds of things. We'll talk about a little bit more about that. And then we have the PV control W, which is a little Windows dialog app that can perform a subset of the utilities that are in the PV control. Um, so in the PV control, it's text-based, like I said. Um, you can set it so that you can, which disks are you gonna control with VD VMDP? Which NIC drivers are you gonna control? You can turn ballooning on and off. Um, you can display the computer name. Some of these happen because the tests, some of the tests I need to run, you have to run in core mode. And some of these things are hard to do if you're just in core mode. So. So like I can display the computer name. Um, I threw in a feature that I can get the CPU IDs of various things. Um, I can scan for new hardware. I can set up to do a manual crash dump. That's just a registry setting. But rather than try to remember where that key is, I just put it in this utility, say turn it on. It sets it up. Um, manual crash dumps are mostly useful in debugging. If you get don't know what's happening, hit the the Shift control, curve control, and it will it will you know do the crash dump. Then you can go see what's happening. Um, then I've got it set up that you can set all the network parameters because if you don't have the dialog box to go set the property page, then this way it will just list them in text format. You can turn things on and off, set values. I found that to be very useful when you're in core mode. Um, and uninstalling applications. I've got applications sometimes that get installed when I'm in core mode. I don't know how to uninstall these, but it lists them. I can say, oh, I want to uninstall that one. It goes through and uninstalls it for me. And then this is a screenshot of the, of the PV control W. Um, like I said, it does a subset, so you can, it's mostly useful for Zen. You can say, do I want to control all disks, just the VDX disks, or none of the disks? Same with LAN. Do I just want all of them, just the net fronts? or none of them. Turn ballooning on and off if you want to use um, instance IDs. And if you want to use a PVV SCSI driver and you want to boot off the SCSI driver, then you got to enable that with the boot PV SCSI. Sometimes you might want to use just one controller for the SCSI. Sometimes you want to use multiple. Um, so I've got that checkbox in there as well. And then you have some other Zen variables that you can adjust as you, as you may need. So the VMDP lifecycle, this is kind of what I do every day. Um, if a new feature comes in, you know, you need to design what needs to happen, implement the feature, then you need to build. 
So we build all the drivers, services, and utilities uh, um, with, uh, with you know, the visual studio on Windows. The QMU guest agent and the VD agent, well, we build those, they're, we build those off of, on a Linux system with MinGW. We just take the upstream package, and bring it down, rebuild it, package it up, put it in the product. Once everything's built, we need to sign those drivers. I'm sure if you've ever installed a, a driver on Windows, you might see that pop up that says, do you really want to install this, install this driver? Because we have no idea where it came from. Um, when, when we put our company signature on that, you still get a pop up, but it says, do you trust SUSE drivers? And once you say yes, then it doesn't bother you anymore. Um, so that's the first signing. We'll talk about a, the, the WICL signing here in a minute. So then once I've got everything signed, then I bundle up the package and so that it's ready that you can install. Um, that creates the VMDP exe, which is a self-extracting zip file that provides all the files that you need to install into your VM. Now that I have it all packaged and installed, now I need to run the WICL tests on it. Wickles, the Windows Hardware Quality Lab kits. Because we currently support Windows 2008, 8R2, 12, 12R2, 2016, 2019, we need four test harnesses to do all those testings. We have the WLK, the HCK, and yes, we need two different HLKs to, to run these tests, one for 2016 and one for 2019. Um, once all the... Tests have passed, we create a submission package, upload it to Microsoft, they review it. Assuming that all tests did pass, then they give us a WICL signature, they sign the driver in the cat file, I downloads, downloads those back down, repackage the thing into the actual VMDP that we release. Now when you install those drivers, it doesn't ask you anything, it just installs it, which is really cool. Um, so to do a WICL test setup, it's, depending on the driver, um, you need a minimum of one machine that runs the WICL test kit, which contains a studio and the controller. You need one SLES host that hosts your VM that you're going to test the driver on. And then if you're going to do net testing, it takes two VMs, and it's usually better to have them on two different hosts. You can run some of them sometimes if they're on the same host with two different VMs. But depending on the test, it's usually best to run on two different hosts. Um, depending on the test and the resources you have, you can run all these tests in parallel. So if you have lots of hosts and lots of VMs, you can run tests at the same time. But, a, a bit of a, if you're re restrained to this minimal thing, then you can yes, just chunk them off one at a time and with all those hosts, with all those VMs and all those drivers, it can take a while. So we try to do as much in parallel as possible. But you can't run the net test in parallel because they use, you know, they use MAC address override. And if you're sending, running two tests at the same time with the same MAC address, they get confused on who gets it, and so the tests fail. So that is the one drawback. Um, so this is a screenshot of one of the HLK um, studio screens. So when you create your WICL project, um, you just select create project, type in a name. You can see I've got a whole bunch up there. Um, and so then that creates the project, gives it a name. So then you need to select which driver you want to do. And in this case, they have machine pools and I'm, in this case it's a Windows 2016 that I'm trying to do. I've, it's highlighted the device manager so it lists all the drivers. And in this particular case, I'm looking for the SCSI driver for Windows. So I click on that, it automatically populates all the tests, and then those are the tests that need to be passed in order to do, to get a WICL certification. You can select all the tests to run at once, well, in, you know, one after another automatically, or you can select them individually, run one, select one, run one. Then once all the tests have passed, then you go to the package tab, and then you, that, that allows you to browse and pick the driver and all of its pieces, bundles it all up. We put the SUSE signature on that, upload it to Microsoft, and then that's when they run through and, and if all passes and they send you back the, the WICL signed drivers. Um, so 
A few challenges when, when running the WICL tests. You have, you know, these are all basically virtual. So some tests, you know, the, the WICL test kit is designed for hardware. And so now you've got these virtual drivers and some of them, ah, they kind of apply, but they kind of don't apply. So there is a little bit of, of, of figuring out, you know, what, what's real there and what, what's, what's, what's important and what's not. Um, the environment setup can be a challenge at times, especially with the land drivers. <laughs> And, and then test failures. Some test failures are real. It's like, oh, you know, I, I didn't do that, right? Let me go fix it. Some of them are like, oh, yeah, this is virtualized. This doesn't really apply. I need to talk to Microsoft, get an errata, and, and we've done that. And, but those are some of the challenges we have. Um, the benefits, like we talked about, you don't get that pop-up. No, it doesn't ask if, you know, if you really want to install that driver, it just does it. Um, and then it gives the customer the the assurance that yes, this driver does meet a minimum Microsoft requirement for a, for a stable quality driver. Um, so the server virtualization validation program is the other, other um, test kit that I run. Um, this focuses on systems rather than drivers. Um, so it doesn't really in involve VMDP, but we usually run the VMDP drivers as we're doing the SVVP testing. Now this setup is a little bit more complicated. You have to have a domain controller. You have to have the machine running the test kit. And then you need an Intel host and an AMD host, both of which are large enough to support your max VM. Um, your max VM, currently what we support are 64 CPUs and 128 gig of RAM. And then you also need to have four master controllers. Those basically manage the test and four subordinate clients which provide the load. Um, and, and so you have, so that's, let's see here the next one. So, so we run this against each version of SLES. So SLES 12 SB5 is about to come out. So I'm gonna be probably when I get back next week, I'll be setting up to, to run SDVP against that. It uses the HLK test kit. Um, and we've talked about these others. Oh, the multiple VM test is you, also, you have to run it against the max, and then you basically cut the max into four pieces and have four VMs. So if you did 64 max CPUs, you would do four 16 CPU VMs. You run those in parallel. Um, so, which means we have a lot of test runs. We have to run everything on Zen, everything on KVM, everything on Intel, and everything on AMD. So it's quite a number of tests. Usually if it passes once, it'll pass everywhere, but you just have to do all those things. It just takes time. Um, the challenge is, for us in our lab, the big thing is disk space. You got those four VMs. If you use um, sparse files, you might run out of disk space. You run out of disk space, your test fails because it can't write, to the, <laughs> write its information back. Um, manual setup, um, the crash dump and the and the debug tests require some special handling, not that it's hard, but it does take manual intervention to get, make sure you have the right adapters, the right connections, so that you can reach up and grab the symbol files for the, for the debug test or have sufficient disk space for the crash dump test. You know, it's just, just uh, nothing hard, but it does take time. Um, also, we need to ensure that every driver in that VM is Wickle signed, otherwise the Sign test will fail because it says, oh, you've got some, some device that's not, the, the, that's not signed. And so that's, a, that's been a, a challenge in the past. Probably our biggest problem we have is our load gen test. It's a 26-hour test. Um, and many times we'll get all the way done. The test is passed and it goes to transmit the results and something happens. And it doesn't get the results. Test gets marked as failed. We get to run the test over again. Um, <laughs> So that, that's been a pain. I mean, eventually we get it, but you know, if we're trying to get them done and it's 26 hours, the turnover just takes a while. But of course, there are the benefits. Once we pass SVVP, we get listed in the server catalog. And you know, again, it gives the customer assurance that Microsoft will support their VM running on SLES. So that concludes my presentation. So if you have any questions, be glad to field those.
So do we, re uh, do we release a separate ISO with the uh, uh, Vertile drivers? Because uh, every time I search for the Vertile drivers for Windows, I only find the uh, Fedora released ones which are signed with uh, Red Hat certificate. So from the point of view of someone who is not into like the development uh, virtualization and only as an end user, uh, from their perspective, it's only Red Hat releasing Vertile drivers. Yes, that has been a challenge. We've tried to figure out how to handle that and haven't gotten a good solution. Um, they are on the SUSE download page, but you have to kind of know where they're at. Um, the, the problem is, is it's currently a, a paid package, and so you don't get it unless you ha sign up for that you know, agreement or whatever they call it. Um, and so, but basically, I mean, if most of the field support people know about it, know where to get it, but just as an individual, like you say, it, it's, it's not easily available to find out where that download page is. But you can always contact me, and I'll be glad to give it to you. <laughs> we, we, yeah, so from, like, like he said, from the ASUS employees can get it from the external download page. Um, I think you have to go to, to SLES products, so you have to kind of drill down a little bit, but you can eventually find it. But yeah, it, it is a challenge, and we wish it was a lot easier. Um, we've we've had tr we've tried to figure out ways to open it up um, so that it's a lot more available, um, but we just for whatever reasons it just hasn't happened. Um, land in, in some disk that uh, well, we yeah, we do have it on our our Zen 100 where I put my put my builds, I always put them out there. I've got my testing thing and my, my release thing, uh, directories, um, which anybody inside SUSE can FTP to that. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, is there any difference in terms of quality? Because if both drivers, Red Hats and SUSEs are based on the upstream open source code of uh, Virtio Win that's hosted on GitHub, um, is there any difference apart from SUSE doing their own uh, WHQL certification and Red Hat doing their own? Like, is there any difference in the source code? There is difference in the source code. Um, Red Hat uses the, well, uh, the newer driver model, whatever they, they call it, where you have to have the co-installer. Um, yeah, our, our driver started out before that, and so I don't have a co-installer. I don't like the idea of a co-installer. To me, it's an extra piece you got to pull it along with you, um, and the, the you know the the kernel driver framework to me is not any more difficult than the other way, so there is that difference. Um, as far as functionality, they should be very similar, um, but yeah, that that is a thing we've thought about lots. Don't know how to solve it, and so we are where we're at. Um, but um, we, we try to, to emulate all the functionality that comes out from upstream um, and, and do our best. That way we've talked several times about open sourcing these drivers and it always gets stalled or blocked somehow. Um, originally, one of the big impediments was because we were charging, Walmart was a big customer and they paid a lot of money for that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, that was the impetus at the time that no, we're not going to open source. And now those contracts have, have elapsed. You know, we've had thoughts about it, but nothing's happened so far. But hopefully in the future we can, we can address that a little bit better. Any last questions before it's time to run off to the next section? Well, I thank you for your attendance. It's, it's been great. Thanks.